Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, the 2nd of December, and you're here at Lunch and Learn. Today, I'm going to do part one of uh, a series we're doing. Uh, Friday will be part two on the idea, uh, concept of home, remote, and telehealth training best practices. As I was telling the, uh, the group here, the panelists, uh, that, you know, Martin and Judy and Richard, some of the terminology you're going to learn is going to be a bit different than what we've actually been using as we talk about this on our Lunch and Learns. Uh, this is going to include all the terminology that you would be used if you want to get especially reimbursed by insurance. There are 40 slides. You will not get these in a handout. This is the property of ISNR, um, and they're not just giving it away. They want people to go to the website and see it and all that. So you'll have the video. It'll be posted. All the slides. I'm going to go through all the slides. If we don't get through them all towards the end, I'll just put them up so you can see them. I may not address them. But quickly, the contributors to this um, uh, would be David Cantor, Mark Trulinger, Teresa Hubbard, all folks involved with, and Emmanuel Russo with the Eisenhower Board of Directors, and of course, Judy here and Richard. Um, well, we went over this initially, some of these concepts in an earlier uh, webinar, which is on the New Mind YouTube channel. I'm going to skip through the APA statements and disclosures uh, because we're not doing this for CE credits. Um, I'm going to skip over the overviews. This will all be um, a part of, um, you know, what you'll see, uh, some letting you see each slide very quickly. Um, uh, so it'll be in the, when you get that on, placed on YouTube. And um, now we're going to start with the actual um, slideshow here. So um, what we're talking about is home remote training best practices. Um, and uh, some of the terms, like I said, are going to be very different. This has become more popular. Um, it's getting to be more widely used uh, by professionals, including medical professionals. I actually had a consult with a doctor the other day who wants to know more about this. Um, so we have more and more people understanding it. But of course, we have this pandemic going on. So the whole concept of doing remote or home training has become very popular. And we've talked about it here quite a bit on uh, the New Mind uh, Lunch and Learns and Neuro at Night. Um, so remote training, or as we call it, telehealth, is referred by the medical professionals as gained popularity in recent years. There's more and more mental health people doing telehealth training. Uh, doctors, there was a piece now, they came out in Science Daily, that emergency rooms are now moving more towards telehealth for the obvious reasons. So all of this is beginning to take place, not only in our world of neurofeedback, but in healthcare in general. Okay, so when we talk about best practices, what we're talking about is some of the just the, the ways to make sure that none of us gets in trouble uh, doing something that would be a sort of outside our either scope of practice or um, something that you know would be problematic with the licensing board in your particular state. As you all know, every state is different uh, how how they look at neurofeedback and. So just be careful about your own guidelines um, and your own state. So the definitions, what's the difference between telehealth, home training, and monitored remote cell training? Telehealth, or remote training as we call it in the field, involves neurofeedback being performed by a qualified practitioner via webcam. So this format that we use as an example of go to meeting or Zoom meetings where you can share a screen and see somebody else's screen, that would be considered a telehealth method of, of doing this. I've done this with some of my home people. I get them on, uh, go to meeting, I can see their screen if I need to, I guide them on electrode placement. So that's sort of a telehealth method. If you're doing this and you are going to bill insurance, these are the codes to use. This service may be documented with the normal CPP codes, 90901, 90875, or 90876. If you meet all the requirements of the CPT codes and you contain the modifier for telehealth 95 or GT and a location change from Office 11 to telehealth 02. So if you're doing that, you'll know what all that means, but do check with your insurance company if you're gonna do billing. Um, monitored remote self-training or home training, as we call it in the field, typically involves a family member being trained how to use the equipment. 
that's what I think most of us are doing. This is what I am doing. So instead of calling it home training, which I've been calling it, it's really best referred to as monitored self training, remote self training. So we're teaching clients to run their sessions at home. These two can be, you know, um, billed for purposes of insurance. Um, oops, I hit the wrong button there. Down here, uh, you can see this. I didn't highlight it, but then uh, I'll leave this slide for just another minute. Same basic codes if you're doing any sort of uh, billing for these services while you're doing remote or home training. What's the difference? Home mobile training refers to a mobile service delivery or a house call as we refer to it in the field. The provider traveling into the person's home and performing the neurofeedback exactly as they would in the office, including bringing all the necessary equipment with them, hooking them up at the client's home or place of residence, i.e. a nursing home, a school, residential treatment facilities. That's what I used to do. Uh, up until this pandemic, I went to a facility and ran sessions there. So that would be an example of that. Again, if people are building insurances, the information down here, uh, Mark Schrullinger is, uh, works very closely with the board of directors. He goes to all the AMA meetings. He is our primary and principal person who's working with the AMA to get all of this uh, set up so that all of us down the road could build insurance if we choose to for doing neurofeedback services. So what should a customer look for in seeking a professional service? The potential home remote telehealth trainee should be look for a qualified and experienced clinical practitioner who's familiar with and has successfully used these services. So um, we all know this, but as this goes out and about, uh, these are one of the reasons why I think it makes good sense for all of us to be involved with professional organizations like AAPB, uh, ISNR, uh, become board certified, uh, we recommend BCIA, and of course other companies including the New Mind uh, Technologies Group is now is certifying persons to use their systems. That's different than board certification by CE, uh, BCIA, <clears throat> but a lot of companies are saying this person is well trained in the use of our software, our hardware, the protocols, QEG interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are some of the things that we want to make sure all of you are really working towards so that you have the necessary backing and folks can't uh, just challenge, you know, what you're doing. Okay. Um, we've talked about this before. Many of the people we're working with are going to be uh, uh, good candidates for home, remote, or telehealth training. But people who have serious disorders like a seizure disorder or stroke may require a highly specialized professional in order to determine the potential benefit and safety for that kind of training at home. I've done that with persons uh, before. In each case, I have had a consulting neurologist who referred the person to me, reviews the sessions with me, helps me establish the protocols, and that's what we're talking about to make sure that you um, don't put yourself in a position of, especially for those of us that are not medical doctors, seizure disorders, strokes, med if it's a medical disorder, by definition, uh, they, you got to be careful about your scope of practice, and we've addressed that many a times before. How are the sessions monitored? Well, um, it depends on the equipment you use and the software you use. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail here. For those of you who have been a part of the new mind system, you understand that your software, and you'll see some examples in some of the slides, records the session. You can review the sessions. You can set up the sessions. You can change the protocols. And our goal, as I understand it still, uh, down the road with the new mind software is to eventually be in a position where we can actually know when someone, if we know a home trainee is going to run a session, that we can sit there, log in at the time they're going to start the session, and watch it in our own software as if that person was sitting in the office with you. So it's very similar to, you know, that kind of training we talked about before where you're doing it via a medium like this, only in this case you'd be just to put your software on and watch the session. And there'll be some things we can do to message uh, the patients along the way or the clients along the way. Um, protocols, of course, they're directed by a clinician. For those of you that have technicians, 
uh, you should be very clear that the technician is assisting only in the overall operation of, of getting the sessions to run smoothly. The protocols really should be established by the clinician. Um, and of course, depending again on the software and the information you use, uh, or the equipment you use, I mean, they can be changed remotely depending on, again, your software and new minds. Anybody? Hello, Rob. Yes. Oh, uh, I, I saw you call. Oh. Yeah, I was just checking. Uh, you, you dropped out, and I didn't know if. Uh, yeah, it looks like my headset died, Richard, for some reason. I don't know if it was on, but uh, uh, where did we drop off? About two slides ago. Okay, I'll go back. Here we okay. go. Okay, yeah, right, so, right at um, the end of that one. Okay, so protocols can be changed depending on your software. Again, um, new mind software, you can change the protocols. This is the example of the protocol, uh, for example, that you can set up and then run through uh, a home trainer um, using new mind software. So, again, credentials. We want to make sure people doing this have been trained properly. Again, we just encourage the 36 hours of didactic training. Of course, this can be done in person. You can do the web course uh, that New Mind offers, and you get 25 hours of mentoring and so forth. So for those of you not uh, BCI certified, think strongly about getting it. It will give you good support if you're doing this sort of training. So. Um, how do we know if someone's making progress? They're, they're working at home, they're running their own sessions. We're sitting here in our offices or in our homes, you know, monitoring sessions. And we've discussed this here as well. There's standard measures you can do if you wanna do repeated sort of testing. Um, but what I find, at least at a personal level, to be very helpful is having people fill out a checklist uh, like the new mind system does. And I, I, they, they fill out a progress tracker. I look at that tracker. I look at the sessions and I try to have contact with all of my trainees a minimum once a week. Some people I'm working with every day, uh, depending on their circumstance. I have a current trainee who has, over the Thanksgiving holiday, had a family member who came over, person tested positive. Now my patient's testing has been tested and waiting to get results doing isolation 
So I said, you know, just keep me posted on what you find out and how you're doing uh, with your sessions. So I have her self report. I have the written progress tracking report. You can use phone calls, all these sort of methods, but that's how we determine progress is, you know, how are they doing? Sometimes this particular case I'm, I'm talking about has a lot of muscle tension. So when I look at those slides and I look at the way we measure the um, trend screens because of the high beta, you know, the sections may not look as good if we're looking at the trend screen analysis in the new mind software. But I know from her self report, and I just did a very detailed, uh, you know, conversation for the other day that, you know, she's having certain social situations that could be affecting things. She's now worried about the virus. So you talk, but all in all, she reports feeling calmer, hasn't had depression, sleeping is better. She's cutting back on use of sleeping aids. And, you know, those are the kinds of things we're looking for. And so, again, in a session, we look at a session like this, and, you know, it looks pretty good. The activation scores are a tad low if you understand the new mind software. If these were 2.0, between 2.0 and 3.0, they'd be great. Beta asymmetry is good. Alpha asymmetry is good. The training efficiency is good. Layering looks good. So, you know, this is how we look at the session and say, okay, how's that person training? Um, so, Clinical oversight is important, and we're going to be using the same basic criteria when we're training people home remotely or through telehealth as we'd be doing if they came in the office. You can have the same conversations, whether it's via email or a quick phone call or a face-to-face -face meeting through Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever format. Um, and uh, the most difficult challenge we all face right now is going to be doing remapping. Uh, sometimes it's just not feasible uh, based on where you live and the, and the density of positive testing, like in our state, we're up at 10% testing as of yesterday, uh, people going in for tests, that's the highest rate we've ever seen. I don't feel comfortable having people come into my home office, which is where I've been working for the past two years, so doing a map isn't going to go happen. But there's other ways of assessing progress and I can look at different sites and so forth. And there's a nice video that Richard did about doing mapless home training. That's on the YouTube channel. Take a peek at that. It gives you some ways of working with people uh, when you can't get maps done. So here's an example of a typical progress review. Um, in this case, the person's sleep has improved and is leveled out quite nicely, positive moods, uh, got better pretty quick and uh, stayed down pretty nicely, nice and level there. Insomnia, a little, you know, up and down in the beginning, but towards the end, smooths out pretty nicely. So those are ways to see how well they're progressing when you're doing remote training. Um, you know, for those of us that are doing this and you're thinking of it from a business model, we do have a few guidelines here. Um, uh, most companies require that purchasers be um, uh, licensed professionals to make sure that it's not getting in the hands of uh, someone who really does, is going to misuse or abuse the equipment. Abuse, and not in the sense of ruining it, it physically, but misusing it with themselves or others. And I've had that happen. So uh, when somebody bought their own equipment, I, I couldn't do anything about it other than to say I'm not uh, willing to work with you any longer because they were running sessions with the child in bed for over an hour and letting them do all these things and just didn't make good sense to me. So most of us get the equipment, uh, we lease it for a reasonable fee. Um, I take a down payment on the cost of the equipment that's refundable when they return the equipment to me. Okay, uh, pricing. Uh, Again, it depends on the software you're using, the hardware you're using, uh, the pricing you charge for your session is going to be based on what you feel your service and your time is worth. Um, and so, again, that's there's individual differences there. Uh, equipment costs different amounts. Uh, whether you take a deposit or not is up to you, but people have sometimes have business insurance that covers it. Again, these are individual things and these are guidelines that we want to make sure that people are aware of that you fall within the guidelines of what the industry is suggesting we do. Um, so no, most importantly, does the service offer materials and support to help market the services? So 
Um, um, having customer service is important. Um, uh, most companies have pretty good service, but uh, t if you're looking to buy equipment, talk with people who use it. Uh, talk with the company, ask them what their, their service uh, hours are and their response time and all that. Um, I found that, you know, working with uh, Jordan and uh, Jason at New Mind, uh, I get pretty quick responses. They get overwhelmed at times, but uh, generally speaking, they're with you the same day. Okay. How does the clinician offer shared use of the unit for multiple family members? And we've discussed this briefly. One can use equipment differently depending on the equipment itself. For example, um, some equipment uh, doesn't have the options that NewMind has. You send the equipment off and there's a built-in protocol in the software and then the, the person has to send back copies of their training sessions to you. And that one would be a bit harder. You'd have to make sure that they're selecting the right protocol designed for a certain person and know how to work the software. NewMind software is pretty clear. Um, you set up home or uh, training uh, credits they uh, run their own sessions. If there's multiple family members using the equipment, and I'm working with folks who do that, or if you're working with the center, has a piece of equipment and a technician, each patient has their own protocol, so they have to sign into the software in order for that session to be run. So that that protects you at one level, but the biggest problem is is somebody using another person's protocol. Um, some clinicians are fine with that if they're doing a standard protocol. The problem is, is you have to know which day and which session was run by a particular patient. I don't encourage people to ever use the same protocol with multiple people, separate protocol for each individual. Um, how does the clinician offer shared use of a unit? Again, if, if, if the software is such where people can run their own individual sessions and having one unit is fine. Um, you can have uh, have one unit. It's it's been assigned to a residential center. They may run up to six or eight kids with one unit, but each kid sign is the the technician signs into that child's account with new mind maps, and that's how the sessions are run. Monitoring sessions uh, for those of you that uh, are looking for what oops the uh, new software is going to be looking like. This is a sneak preview of it. Um, with the new software that we're test driving now, you can select um, up here, you says clinic plans, and this would be for people coming into your clinic and then home plans. I don't have clinic plans. I'm doing everything remotely. So these are my individual uh, uh, persons and their protocols. Uh, I do some beta testing for things. That's what beta means there. <laughs> so, but you can see in this case, this person's got uh, one session completed with this current protocol, which is SMR up. This person has a new setup, hasn't done a session yet, has 19 credits left. This person has uh, done 12 sessions with this particular protocol, has 11 uh, sessions left. And this protocol call can, of course, be changed at any point in time. This person has had three sessions, zero credits, um, got more credits recently. This person's got seven sessions they've run, six more credits remaining. So this offer gives you a nice one-shot view of who you're running and what their status is with credits and sessions to date. But keeping in mind that this sessions run is only for that protocol. This person's been on the same protocol, 14 sessions, uh, is doing really well. Okay, are the sessions being charged per by use, per time period, unlimited use, or by a package plan? Again, that depends on the manufacturer you work with, how the software works. A lot of people in office will sell so many sessions. You know, if you buy 10 sessions, we throw in the 11th one free. That's sort of up to you how you want to market yourself, how you want to charge for uh, remote uh, training. We talked about hardware, so. Again, it should just be specific for, you know, doing what you want to be doing. Um, there are different pieces of equipment you can buy on the market or that patients can buy. <clears throat> uh, if you're going to look at some of those pieces of equipment, make sure that it offers you the option to do the kinds of training and protocols that you want to do, because some 
pieces of equipment have fixed protocols and that's all they're going to do. Others have very limited in terms of how many, what types of sessions you can do and, and the sites you can use. So again, you have to do your research and make sure that it's going to provide you with the uh, information and the quality of training that you want to provide to your clients and patients. Okay. Um, most of the equipment that people buy is durable, so we don't have to worry about maintenance. I just uh, in, encourage my patients just to keep it in a safe place away from uh, children, away from animals. I have to constantly think in my house if I put something down that I have two cats who love anything that's new and different. So putting a unit on a countertop in my house would result in the unit being on the floor and used as a cat toy and slid around for quite some time. All right, software, we've talked about that. Most of the system seen thus far run one, two, and four channel training. Some systems have developed other capabilities beyond that. Um, again, you'd have to think about the complexity of that. Uh, there are people who apparently do home training with caps. Um, so you have to, again, just think in terms of how, how well can your patient set up your system, how well can that person uh, be able to be assisted by another family member or friend to run a session or put electrodes on themselves. Those are all things you can do through telehealth meetings and face-to-face -face meetings or in office if you give them everything and train them in your office before they take it home. Um, <clears throat> now for, for the actual clients and patients, you want to make sure they have some sort of a written manual or instructions on how to do that, uh, how to run the equipment, how to set the, you know, how to set up sessions and run sessions, et cetera. With the new mind system, um, there's a manual out that I wrote. I need to update it. Uh, but it's got, we've got a few new things I need to add to that manual. Um, the New Mind Technologies has a checklist that is a setup checklist. You run down that, it's like two or three pages. Uh, so between that, and there is actually videos that you can have your patients log into to see. So New Mind, for example, offers manuals, uh, written instructions, as well as uh, some videos that the patient can watch. Um, I like whenever possible to be able to show somebody how to do all this in office but with the pandemic as it is now i do everything remotely through mediums like zoom or go to meeting um this is just an example of the manual that i wrote for new minds so they're just a you know you have a table of contents and all that online supervision we should be able to provide uh your clients and patients with the ability to have contact with you through the mediums we've talked about skype Go to meeting, Zoom, all of that, uh, those kinds of options, so that uh, you can sit with them face to face if need be and watch how they hook themselves up or have them answer questions for you or discuss things where it's more personable. So I certainly encourage that. Um, and then the, I do daily communications with people as needed through emails. I'm not a big texter person, so I don't want patients texting me because anybody who knows me well knows that they might text me and I might even see it for a day. And my phone is typically on silent if I'm working, so I may not hear a phone ringing. Um, so again, that's my preference. So you have to look at what works best for you and your practice. Are you sitting in your office monitoring this or are you working at home and just doing like I do with uh, remote training? What's your schedule look like? How can you best communicate with those persons that you're working with and those trainees to make sure that they have all the information they need? If they have a question, they can reach you pretty quickly. Session management. Um, your state laws will guide you in terms of, you know, what kind of records you need to keep and for how long based on your license and discipline. Um, but for the sake of running sessions, what we've put in here is the time of day is important. So from an IR SNR perspective, we feel that running sessions from six in the morning to six at night is probably the preferred time for most people. You may have somebody who works uh, an afternoon shift and their schedule is different then you would work with them specifically in terms of different times, but it's one of the challenges you're gonna face. Um, I have a guy I've worked with, he's, he's, he's came to me because his sleep is poor 
and he's up on his computer. And I noticed the other day that he's running a session at 1236 in the morning. That's when he starts his session. So I had to have a chat about, I really don't want you running sessions at that time of the day. Depending on the session you run, yeah, some of them can relax you. They can maybe get you to sleep. But if you're training in certain areas for focus and attention or something, you may wind up getting the person more energized after the session. And then they may not get to sleep really easily. So we think reasonable time frames makes good sense uh, for training patients and clients. Again, session management, this is an example of new mind software. I can set up the time. Now you can see here, this is a 30 minute session. It's eyes closed, it's a two channel training. Um, and this is the protocol that I'm using. And then I always type in eyes closed or eyes open up here because that's what shows up when I'm seeing the actual protocol. And I have to go back and check the, the whole plan information. So again, session management uh, with new mind software, we set up at home training, we click on yes. Person has so many uh, credits to their balance, the type of um, feedback options we're gonna use, a progress tracker, whether it's being used or not. This is an eyes open training. It's a, the active plan. No sessions have been completed. We just set up this protocol. And again, it's labeled and just an example again of how you manage your sessions based on your software. But you want to be able to know whatever software you're using, what the protocol is. So if you need to, you take screenshots, you put it into a Word document, save it in a file, whatever it is that you can refer quickly and easily to any protocol you're working with, given the patients or clients using remote training. The practitioner should have access to all the training sessions for review. This is often done through internet-based software, NewMind being an example. Uh, sessions saved to disk and mail. That was typical when I was doing training with BrainMaster. Um, or they emailed me uh, the folder and file for the sessions or real-time connectivity, which is one of the things that uh, we're working on as well with NewMind. Session data should be uh, exchanged through secure data transfer connections uh, just for all that HIPAA privacy and having a method to observe the trainee if need be. And again, Skype is an option. Um, keeping in mind, uh, all of us working, if you're licensed, you have legal and ethical obligations you need to pay attention to. So if you're training with somebody who wants you to work with them in a different state, make sure that you can do that without putting yourself into some sort of jeopardy. Um, you want to make sure whatever your discipline is that you follow the standards of practice and the ethics for your profession, MD, social worker, clinical counselor, psychologist, nurse, whatever it is. And those may vary from state to state. And then of course, if you're BCIA certified, you want to follow those guidelines as well. And uh, members of organizations like ISNR, which is why we developed these to help people make sure that they don't get themselves into some trouble by trying to help somebody and not doing things in, in a proper uh, manner or fashion. What are some of the challenges? And you've heard us talk about this, and uh, this is really important. Uh, probably the most common challenge is compliance. When people came to see me in my office, I had a set date and a set time for them. I'm one of the believers that uh, based on, and we've talked about this and shown you the Kaiser Sturman slides, there's a, everybody has a circadian rhythm that varies through the day. So if you're gonna be comparing sessions, it's nice to have them train the same time. So you're not looking at a morning session versus a mid afternoon session where there's more slow wave because then the sessions may look different. So I try to get the people that are working with me at home to work with me in the same way as they would have if they were coming into the office. Not an easy thing to do. Um, so I have to keep that in mind when I'm comparing sessions. So in uh, the software I use, which is NewMind software, it gives you the time of the session. Then I can compare sessions and say, okay, well, the reason there's more of this slow wave here is they ran this session, you know, mid afternoon and, the, first, the other one the day before was like 10 in the morning. And so there's gonna be some differences there. Um, if they're running several sessions on the same day, and some people do that, even with remote training, 
then you know they're going to be differences just looking at again a session run at two different times during the day so compliance in terms of running a session once a week minimally and one of the things i found that i'm doing now with people the fee i charge them uh includes uh the I, I charge them by the week and the fee I charge includes the leasing of the equipment and review of two sessions. And I make it known to them, if you just do one session, there's no refund. Uh, I expect you to do two sessions a week. I expect them to be spread apart by so many days. And if you don't run a session or if you skip a week, there's no refund, you're being billed regardless. This helps work towards compliance because I think for most people, um their financial matters is dear and especially during this time of this virus and uh, misuse of the equipment um you know allowing other people to use their their equipment and you don't know about it uh, so be careful with that um misuse of protocols this can be a problem if the equipment is not safeguarded to prevent a trainee from altering or changing a protocol and one particular case i worked with many years ago this would date back probably somewhere around uh, 10 years ago. The guy I worked with had purchased his own piece of equipment, learned how to use it, and he was changing protocols around. And this is the same guy that was running his son in the evening, sitting in bed, an hour long session watching TV. So I finally said, I can't work with you uh, because you're, you're doing things that I haven't authorized. And if I'm gonna be the responsible clinician, Either you're following my directives or you find somebody else to work with you, and that was that. Um, again, looking at progress tracking, that should be done minimally once a week. So now people are doing this can be done via telephone, email summaries, online tracking systems. People who don't report weekly progress may not gain benefits from monitored remote self-training. We, we need to know how they're doing. Is the protocol making sense? Is it working or not? These are all important questions um remote training is important it should be explained to the trainee before it starts if the standard is to have one or two sessions per week in the office the same standard should be required with home or remote training services if the number of sessions for hrt should be determined in the same way as you would having the person come in the office you want to make sure that they're following those protocols so again that sort of working with the patient, setting up expectations. Many of us have contracts and outline those things in the contracts. And in my contract, it clearly states, failure to follow the directions I've given them for using this type of home and remote training uh, means I can choose to no longer continue to work with them. So I make it pretty clear. Um, Again, uh, some of the challenges are is are is making uh, uh, changes to protocols. Uh, depending on your equipment, it may be that sometimes you have to have the equipment come back to you, or you have to have to have them download a new file. Uh, the routine uh, software we use with NewMind protocols can be changed in the moment. There, you can just uh, say, "Okay, we're doing this protocol next time," and and, it, and you do it from your home or office and, and the protocol set up and it, and it runs. Routine assessment should be performed with home remote training as it would be with any standard office treatment at the same intervals. Some software may allow for telehealth assessment in absence of the ability to conduct an in-office QEEG. And what they mean by that is, and it's not a, a QEEG when you do this, but you, you could hook somebody up and you can say, let's put the electrodes here. This is sort of what I'm doing with folks, and I, I get a baseline of how the how the how the uh, brain waves look at a, at certain locations. It's not like a cue, but I have a sense of what may be higher, what may be low. It helps guide me to work in a certain area if I'm looking to use a certain protocol. All right, we're about ten uh, about a few minutes ten to the hour, so I'm going to stop. Um, I'm going to go uh, put this up uh, again, um, my contact information. Uh, we'll unmute folks um, and take questions if people have any questions. While everyone is getting unmuted, can, uh, you can hear me okay, right? I, I'm, I have a bit of an, I don't know why. Uh, I want to just make a comment or two and also say that even though we're doing another one on 
on Friday with someone else, perhaps we might have a question and answer period next week again that is a little more specific and may not want to go into this particular uh, uh, recording. So I want to I want to offer that out and we can all talk about it and see whether that would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that when we in the beginning when we were talking about the codes and I know everybody wants insurance coverage if you can get it. Okay. And so the codes though that 90875 and 90876 they include psychotherapy with them. And I think we all have to stay cognizant of that if you're thinking about utilizing remote training or remote home training monitored um, and submitting it for insurance. So please be aware that 90875 and 90876 require a psychotherapy component that um, meets the proper standards. So that's the one thing I wanted to say. And um, I'm gonna back off and talk, uh, I have some more comments based on, we have 15 units that are out and about and I, I, I certainly have some more comments about it to make, but I want to open up to questions uh, to start with. So I'll back off here. Okay. Hi, this is Thanks, Kathy. Jean. Hello. Hi. Yeah, this we hear you. Kathy River, yeah. I just wanted to put a shout out also for your next week's seminar for Tina and Steve. Because I've just been trained by her a lot in home use, too. So I know they have a lot of great tips and it'd be well worth it. And I found out a lot of things I didn't know I didn't know. <laughs> and I always do. So it just is, you know, even though you're doing this, the other, they, they both will work really well and expand people's repertoire. OK. Yeah, no, thanks for that, that comment. Uh, actually, I talked with Tina in detail and sent her my slides, and, and we agreed that putting these basic guidelines up first made the most sense as sort of an overview. This is an overview. This isn't going to get into the detail. They will get into more detail about some of the practices that we've just outlined here uh in this overview and then you know like other examples of challenges or equipment and software and how to run sessions and all that so that's how tina and i decided to run this as a as a series and 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 i agree with judy that you know there may be a lot of other questions that won't fit into the time frame we have here or even after friday when uh, with tina and steve's session so we will do a follow-up um on this topic which would be sort of an open discussion following the the this these two uh, webinars for people to dialogue in more detail. But thank that's a great great uh, lead in for Friday's session. Thank you, Rob. What does HRT stand for? It's the abbreviation for Home Remote. Oh, and training. telehealth. Training. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I was thinking. Yeah. Like, when I put this together for ISNR. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I put it together for ISNR, and uh -huh. um, and uh, I I didn't even have the word telehealth in there. It was really uh, again the work of Mark Trulinger here, who's been working closely with the AMA, who said, "Look at if we're going to put these guidelines out, we really need to make sure." that um, we cover this from the perspective of um, of the medical profession who will guide CPT codes and how we build things. So of course we were very open to that instead of having to reinvent the wheel again. So it went from remote training or home training to home remote and telehealth and he put together those definitions that um, I showed you in the first slides here. He he wrote those down for us, okay. and then put the particular codes in it. So I'll go through each of these slides. I'll just leave them up for another minute or two while we're taking more questions, so you can see them. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions or comments? I'll put another comment in while people are deciding if they're going to 
ask some questions. I want to say that uh, the New Mind Home Trainers, because they allow for a variety of family members or people in the household to train, and they all have different access. So it is much easier to keep track. So for example, it's not uncommon for one family member to talk to me about doing a remote training and then say, I, and, and, and I'd like it too, and maybe my others. So I have had uh, three, a mother and two ch children, for example, um, come in and they all get mapped. And well, because I, I see people in the office, so I, I can get a map. And what I tend to do is see people twice. I don't, unless they're driving, like if they've driven two hours, I might do it all in one shot. But otherwise, I make people come back twice and I get a sense of their dedication to the idea after the first session because I don't want to give out a home unit even if people are paying the money for it I want them to use it and I nothing gets me angrier than when a, they're paying for a home unit and they don't do the training so I'm pretty cautious in that way now I'll back off again. We still have time for your question. Well, no, that's beautiful, Judy. And here's the example. Again, when we when the new software comes out, this could be exactly what Judy's talking about. This could be three people or four people in the same home. You know, this could all be just different different members of the same family, but they all have their own account. So you can see where each of them stands in terms of what session, how many sessions they've run with that particular protocol. This is protocol based, how many sessions are remaining and so forth. So that's a great point, Judy, thanks. Remember, we already have the ability to have all four of them have separate accounts on New Mind. Right here, yeah. this is new software. I know I'm just like reinforcing what you're saying, Rob. This is new software that lets you see it all at the same time, but it is already present that all of those people will have different accounts, which makes tracking much easier, you know? So, and this new piece of software will make it even easier, which is uh, a lot of what I watch NewMind try to do is make everything very, very user-friendly. I have a comment, if I may. Please. Carl Johnson here. Yeah, just a, logist, a logistical thing. We um, have been using a platform known as BodySight, and it includes the ability to do uh, HIPAA compliant messaging, you know, where it's like the person can message you and it ends up coming to your email or your text, or however you want to set up the platform. And then, so you have the ability to communicate about the different um, sessions via that um, and in addition to that uh, it also has a telehealth portion to it where you can do a face-to-face -face on it as well built in and then it also has the ability to uh, send pre-programmed uh, messages to a person over a period of time for like say diet work or whatever you're doing with them as in addition to or as an educational process part of the some training that you want them to do on um, concepts about neurofeedback or whatever you know you can just set that all up and it comes out automatically based on the schedule that you design it's really it's really a helpful tool in, in my practice I use it um, with all of our home training patients That's great I have stuff, another Carl. I have uh, Carl, let, me just say, let me just say to call quickly one of the things we're hoping to do with the new mind is when the patient is running a session and we have it where we can actually li watch the session live, we're going to have the ability to do one of those things, Carl, which is type a message that will pop up on their screen that says, yeah. like, you know, it looks like one of your electrodes is a bit loose or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Judy, go ahead. No, not me. Go ahead. It was Tiffany K. Goldschrift talking. Tiffany, okay, Tiffany hey. go ahead. <laughs> hey. I I just wanted to hop on that bandwagon and just uh, let people know that I use this HIPAA compliant texting app called OHMD OMED and you can attach PDFs and they have different packages. The one that I use is free and, I, you know, just like Carl, I use it a lot with my home trainers and just my in-office clients too because it's just super helpful for messaging and, 
and things of that nature. And you can do the video um, telehealth, telemed um, as well. You, it's just a different package, but for other people who may need something like that, OHMD has been really great. I've probably used it for five years. Well, great. Uh, Tiffany and Carl, both, if you, if, if this is software that others can have access to through purchasing, um, would you be willing to, both of you, post uh, links so our listserv people can see um, what those options are and how it works? Absolutely. I'll do that soon. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, I can do that. Perfect. Thanks, Carl. Yep. All right, we're close to the top of the hour. We can take maybe one more quick question. Otherwise, we'll pick up with this on Friday with Tina and Steven's presentation. All right. All right, Rob, looks like that's it. Great presentation, really well put together. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. A bit rushed, but we got through all the slides. <laughs> no, it's, it was great. I'll have to have our staff review it, too. Definitely. All right. Okay, well, Richard uh, and Judy and Martin, uh, we'll see everybody Friday. Thanks for attending, and I'll send out a reminder. And for those that had to ask, uh, usually Richard will send out the reminders. For, for the Neuro at night, those come out typically Monday afternoon. Uh, before Neuro at night, for Wednesday, the reminders typically come out Tuesday afternoon, uh, the uh, the links, and for the Friday webinars, they typically will go out like tomorrow, Thursday afternoon, sometime in the mid to late afternoon, so always check your email first. If you didn't get the link, let us know, and we'll repost it like we did today. Thanks, everybody. See you Friday. See you Friday.